Anyhow, we're going to talk about the international perspective on perineal dialysis, and I'm really going to talk about a reassessment of the role of PD in the managing the patient with end-stage renal disease. Um, one thing that's wonderful about nephrology, there are these international organizations that sort of get together, um, provide guidelines, provide standards of care, and there's a consensus that develops around the world globally about how patients ought to be managed. And the end result of this, I think, is a really dramatic improvement in the outcomes of patients. And I think it's worth looking around the world at the way things have practiced, uh, practice patterns that occur, and that we can learn a lot from what goes on in other countries, both the developed as well as the developing world. So we'll talk about a little bit of that um, today. So I have no relevant disclosures. I'm going to talk about the improved outcomes with PD in recent years. We talked yesterday about the excellent data for PD use with AKI and the use of PD for urgent start dialysis. But I'm going to talk about some of the new approaches to PD therapy, some lessons we can learn as we travel around the world, and some comments on the worldwide expansion of PD. So first, the, this, this issue of um, PD's role in managing patients with end-stage renal disease and what the outcomes are is a subject that's been confusing. The literature has been sort of back and forth on this issue. From my perspective, there really is a universal agreement now that the outcome data comparing PD and HD patients are really no different. So if you, so if you look at data such as this, this is the data from Ontario shown on the left and data from the USRDS shown on the right, you can see there really are no difference in outcomes for patients um, on PD compared to HD, whether they have diabetes or don't have diabetes. And I think this is accepted from most registry data now, again, from the US, Canada, Holland, and other registries as well. So I think this issue of whether patients should be told one therapy is better than the other in terms of outcomes, mortality rates, I think has been laid to rest. And I'm not going to discuss that part of it further. But what I showed this slide yesterday, and we talked about the decline in mortality rates with PD over time. So the, the line in orange, which is the top line, shows a steep drop-off in mortality rates in PD over time compared to hemodialysis, which is in the lighter yellow line where the line is really much flatter. And again, this is again from the USRDS from 2014. This shows um, mortality rate by ESRD vintage from less than two years, two to five years, and five or more years. And again, the PD shown on the upper right, the hemo on the lower left, and you can see there really is this really dramatic improvement in the outcomes of PD over time. And this was very nicely captured in a paper that Raj Mahotra published in KI about a few years ago now. But I think this really reaffirms the data which I just showed you. And this was looking at technique survival and patient survival in different time periods. And you can see that this is a people on PD, um, CAPD and APD. The numbers of patients is very large. And you can see there's really a dramatic improvement both in technique survival and patient survival. So uh, the data's gotten good, but the data really could be a lot better. This is a paper that we had put together looking at the FMC database. Um, and it looked at first year outcomes in 1,300 incident ESRD patients starting PD in the FMC dialysis units in, in the United States. 21% transferred to HD which seems like a high number to me. In New England, in our region, where we track this carefully, about 15% of patients transfer each year. And this goes back to the point that Rob mentioned yesterday, that if you look at the numbers of patients who start PD, after two years, only about 50% are on. A percentage transfer to hemodialysis, a percentage die, and those numbers are about equal, and then a percentage are transplanted, so that the number remaining on PD is only really about 50%. But anyhow, 56% of these patients were hospitalized and 28% of them developed peritonitis. So although PD results have gotten better, there's a lot of work that really needs to be done to improve these outcomes, and it's something I think we need to keep focused on. So what are the who've been largely responsible for the improvement in the mortality rates that we've seen in people maintained on peritoneal dialysis? Again, the argument is that the presence of peritonitis, if it lingers for a while or does not resolve, can result in mortality rates, again, primarily related to cardiovascular mortality, mortality rates because of the high inflammatory state that occurs. So to me, this is really a crucial um, uh, guideline from the ISPD. And the ISPD, has, again, has guidelines on reducing the risk of infections. And I summarize sort of the key findings here. Adequate training time for patients, 
proven monitored protocols, hand washing, wearing masks, et cetera. Um, we found, for example, that if we um, interview patients who we've trained and you bring them back in six months or a year and you ask them how often they wash their hands or they wear masks, the patients are not nearly as compliant as you'd like to think they would be. And we now sort of instituted retraining sessions for patients on a routine basis and certainly retraining patients after, a after every episode of peritonitis. Exit site topical antibiotics have now become the standard of care, either using mepiracin or gentamicin on the exit site. Retraining after infection becomes critically important because, again, it, re it, it sort of reinforces the compliance of patients. And we've actually now retrained patients on an annual basis because of this problem of patient compliance. You have to carefully monitor patient compliance. And now, we again, we ask patients on a routine basis do they wash their hands? Do they wear their masks? Do they follow the standard protocols which we strain them on? Um, again, you want to avoid hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia has been associated with infections because hyperkalemia can slow down bowel um, peristalsis and you can have trans-bowel migration of organisms. Psychosocial factors can have a big impact on um, peritonitis rates, for example. And I'll show you data on that in just a second. And again, you have to have ongoing quality assurance and a CQI program to track what's actually happening in the facility. Prophylactic antibiotics of the exit side have now become the standard of care, again, worldwide, I think. Um, the upper left-hand graph shows several studies, six studies that looked at mepiracin at the exit site and its impact on infection rates. Um, this is looking at reducing staph aureus infection rates in PD patients. The results are the same, basically, across all six studies. And on the lower right is the paper, classic paper, again, from the University of Pittsburgh on reducing gram-negative exit site infection rates using gentamicin compared to mepiracin. So the standard of care in most units is using gentamicin at the exit site. Um, there's a concern about resistance to gentamicin developing with some of those um, with long-term use. So some units actually change back and forth between gentamicin and mupiracin. But importantly, some antibiotics should be put at the exit side on a routine basis for all patients. Depression and the risk of peritonitis. This is a study we had published in HAKD in 2003 and has not gotten really nearly enough attention, I don't think. So this was looking at um, BDI scores, Beck Depression Inventory Scores, in, uh, which we gave routinely to patients maintained on, on peritoneal dialysis. We gave it out on a six-monthly basis, and then we looked at the peritonitis rates in the six months after we administered the BDI. Um, and we then looked at the relative risk of infections. And for those patients who had Beck depression inventory scores greater than 11, there was nearly a threefold greater incidence of peritonitis than those who had scores less than 11. And there was no effect of age, diabetes, or coronary artery disease in this. So in our experience, if you screen patients for depression, we routinely now screen patients with psychosocial areas of difficulty. If you screen patients with a Beck depression inventory score and they have a score that's over 11, they have a very high likelihood of having a clinical depression. And the depression can really increase the risk of infection from a variety of reasons. And depression can affect the immune system, depression affects compliance and, and adherence to protocols, et cetera. And what's important about this is depression can be treated. And I'll give you a reference down here in a review article we published in KI in 2012, where we outlined very carefully the, how diagnosis of depression should be made and various treatment algorithms for this, including um, various medications that can be used and how those actually ought to be dosed. So in our, what we think is important is routine screening of psychosocial factors such as depression should be built in as part of the routine care of patients. Um, and that we need to develop strategies to address these. And my guess is this could have a significant impact on infection rates and outcomes of patients. Now, no one has shown that part of that, and that's the piece that we actually needs to be looked at. There are a couple of trials that have now been started looking at treatment of depression in patients on dialysis and seeing how that affects outcomes, but those studies have not been completed yet. So depression occurs commonly and at any point in time, about 25 to 30 percent of dialysis patients, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, will have a clinical depression. Um, and that depression is associated with a higher mortality rate, a higher complication rate, a higher infection rate. That depression can be treated. 
as outlined in the Kidney International article shown here, whether the treatment of depression though improves outcomes is a piece that's not been shown yet. And that's sort of an interesting issue that I think does need to be addressed. And catheter placement we talked about yesterday. The, the catheter placement with advanced laparoscopic placement that John Crabtree has really promoted results in extremely high catheter success rates. And the key part about this advanced laparoscopic placement is that you use rectus sheath tunneling before entering the peritoneal cavity, lysis of adhesions if they're present, which you see with the laparoscope, and an omentopexy for redundant omentum. That means that you tack the omentum up to the anterior abdominal wall so it won't interfere with catheter function. And John Crabtree describes catheter success rates of 99.5%. And I guess we'll get a better handle on what success rates are when Rob gets his catheter um, registry sort of organized and we can actually track outcomes. The problem with the Crabtree approach is you can get very high success rates, but placing a laparoscopic catheter generally requires general anesthesia. Not all patients who need catheters are candidates for general anesthesia because they may be ill. And if we're talking about urgent start dialysis, and we talked about this yesterday, you can have trouble getting a laparoscopic placement scheduled. And we'll, again, folks are looking at nephrology placing catheters, interventional radiologists placing catheters, general surgeons placing catheters. So I think you need to be flexible about catheter placement. In an ideal world that you're electively scheduling PD placement, the advanced laparoscopic placement is probably the way to go. Um, but you have to be flexible. If you, don't, if you can't do it, patient's not a candidate for general anesthesia, it can't be scheduled in time, there are other options that one can really look at. And success rates can be high with those as well. But again, Rob will hopefully answer this for us, right? In a couple of years, Rob? A little longer maybe, right? Okay. I want to shift now and talk a little bit about the dose of dialysis. And to me, this is sort of a crucial area here. And again, this has come from studies that have been done all around the world. And again, it's interesting to look at lessons which we can learn from studies done globally. So the ISPD published guidelines on solute and fluid removal goals for patients on PD. And the guidelines were published in, in PDI in 2006. But let me summarize them. That you need a minimal K to V urea of 1.7, which represents the sum of the peritoneal and residual renal function. So for aneuric patients, you need to have a peritoneal K to V of 1.7, right? I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. But the important point I want to stress is that there is no evidence of an improvement in outcomes with higher doses of dialysis. And that's based on the three studies shown below. The randomized trial by YK Lowe and Kidney International, the ADAMX trial that was published in Jason in 2002, and a study we had done with Linda Freed published in AJKV in 2008. And let me just go through these because this is to me an absolutely crucial point on about PD. So the ADAMX study. The ADAMX trial was uh, based on uh, creatinine clearance, and the hypothesis was that if you increase the creatinine clearance in for patients, that you actually could improve outcomes. And people now have abandoned creatinine clearance measurements as a routine measurement for the dose of dialysis in PD patients, and they shifted to K2V ureas. So I'm going to show you the ADAMX data using K2V ureas as a dose of dialysis, and that's what's shown here. So the groups were split into a K2V that was set at 2 and one that was set about 1.7, really, perhaps a little bit less than 1.7. And you see there's a very nice split that occurs over the 28 months of the study. And when you look at outcomes, on the left is shown mortality rates. Mortality rates are identical in the two groups. There was no improvement for driving up the K to V to 2 compared to 1.65 or 7, 1.7. And they also published data on health-related quality of life measures, and that's shown on the right-hand panel. And this is looking at the physical composite score on the SF36. So the physical composite score, the lower the score, the worse your health-related quality of life. Um, the way this, the, the PCS score works from the SF36, it's normalized in the general population. The score would be about 50. Dialysis patients, as a rule, have significant impairments in physical functioning, um, and this physical well-being, and their scores are low, and their scores are typically about 38, which is what you see here, and the scores tend to decline over time the longer patients are on dialysis. But if you look at the control group and the test group, 
you can see there is no difference over time. But if anything, it's the control group that's feeling a little bit better. Now, it's not statistically significant, but there certainly is not even a suggestion that the lower dose of dialysis results in an impairment in health-related quality of life. And the same findings occur when you look at the mental component score on the SF36, which is looking at more psychosocial, emotional components. So having a higher dose of dialysis does not improve mortality, does not improve health-related quality of life in up to 36 months of follow-up. The YK Low study, again published in 2003 in Kidney International, was a randomized trial of 320 patients where they were um, targeted to have a K2V of 1.5 to 1.7, a K2V of 1.7 to 2, and a K2V that was greater than 2. And they, uh, you know, the people were started originally in, in China. Again, the people in Hong Kong, the people are small, not large body weight. They could start initially three two-liter exchanges a day. And the dose was increased to adjust the, maintain the patients in their targeted range. And again, this is the mortality rates in the three groups. There's no significant difference in the group. So the group, 1.5 to 1.7, 1.7 to 2 and greater than 2 have no difference in their outcomes. The biggest difference, though, is that the way the study was designed, if nephrologists thought the patients weren't doing well, they could pull the patients out of the study and adjust their dialysis dose independently. So a larger number of patients in group A were pulled out of the study because they weren't feeling well. So this was more of a subtle thing. It was hard to come up with a specific, there wasn't a test that was given to measure it, but the nephrologists thought the patients weren't doing well, they should be pulled out of the study and their dose of dialysis should be increased. So that occurred in the group A patients, but in the group B and the group C patients, there was no difference. So there was, it, it's not as though having the dose over two did not make patients feel better than they did if they were in 1.7 to two. And the last study is a study that we had done, and this was a slightly different approach. We decided to look at patients from the time they became anuric, that's if they had a urine output less than 100 cc's, and this is data taken from DCI and from, from our home dialysis program. So there are a large number of patients in the three groups, about 300 in the lower doses and about seven, almost 800 in the larger dose. And after adjustments, the K2V less than seven was associated with an increased mortality rate but importantly, there was no difference between the groups with the K3 of 1.7 to 2 and those that are greater than 2. So again, the three studies, if you take them all together, show, uh, to me, a very similar kind of pattern, which is that K2Vs less than 1.7 result in patients not feeling as well and perhaps a higher mortality rate. 1.7 to 2 and greater than 2, the outcomes are going to be the same in terms of mortality rates and health-related quality of life. So why is this so important? Why am I spending so much time on this and why am I emphasizing this? Well, it turns out that we, I think we have to understand what the risks are of dextrose exposure. And one of our goals now is to limit dextrose exposure as much as possible. And we'll go through why this is. That we need to focus attention on better preservation of the peritoneal membrane and better maintenance of ultrafiltration. What's clear is the dextrose exposure to my, to my interpretation of the literature, the dextrose exposure in the peritoneal analysis solution damages the peritoneal membrane, impairs ultrafiltration, and in its end result can result in encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. So what is it that we want to do then to try to prevent these adverse outcomes from occurring? The model we should use is this. This is what I'm, I'm, the argument we try to make. We want to measure residual renal function as a K2V at the time patients start dialysis. Describe enough dialysis to achieve a K2V of 1.7 to 2. And importantly, there is no benefit in driving up the K2V greater than 2. So what we do in New Haven is this. We made a decision the patient's going to start dialysis. We then shift and get a 24-hour urine and measure a K2V urea in the endogenous renal function. We then model a dose of PD, which is necessary to achieve a K2V of greater than 1.7, but we try to keep it less than 2. And the idea of this, we're trying to set up a strategy to minimize dextrose exposure, which, we, which I'm going to argue in a second with you is the thing that's responsible for damaging the peritoneal membrane. And, and the preferred model which we use is to start patients in two long-dwell icodextrin exchanges per day for those who have an endogenous K2V of 1 or higher. So if someone's starting dialysis and you get a K2V urea and it comes out at 
you put them on two exchanges a day, they're going to come out with a K to V that's probably going to be at 1.8 or 1.9. So why use the um, two lycodestrin exchanges? Well, there are other models that you can use. Some people, for example, put people on the cycler at night and leave them to dry during the day. Some people have put people on dialysis five nights a week, skip, give them two days off. Again, they're trying to achieve a targeted K to V of 1.7 to 2. Our argument on the icodextrin, two exchanges a day is minimal. The patient does it when they get up in the morning before they go to bed at night. And with the ultrafiltration, you know, with, this, with icodextrin, you'll have a gradual sustained ultrafiltration over a long period of time. So the impact on the patient's life is really minimal. And you can sort of remove small, middle-sized molecules because of the long exposure of the, um, of, of the blood to the peritoneal membrane. So having long dwell exchanges to us really is an advantage, and patients really like this regimen really very well. So what I need to talk about is that icodextrin is approved for only one, one exchange a day. But if you go through the literature, there are these five papers that have all looked at using two icodextrin exchanges a day in various formats. There's again, again, it's a global thing. There are patients from Turkey. There are two studies from our group in New Haven. There's one from Brussels, and there's a paper from Toronto. So, at least five papers have done this, and there have been abstracts at meetings from, again, all around the world of people doing this, and it really does appear to be safe with really no adverse outcomes. Now, there is data to suggest that icodextrin can have an effect to, preserve, pre to prevent um, damage to the peritoneal membrane. And, and this is in a study, and I'm going to take you through this sort of slowly here for a second. This is a paper that Simon Davies did which is part of the EPO study. The EPO study was a study looking at automated PD um, in, in a European population. Um, so it's people who were um, just starting automated PD and looking at their outcomes. The details aren't that important to that study. But which, which Simon looked at, and I'm going to show you Simon's other data in just a minute. He looks at the changes in dialysate plasma transport characteristics over time, and he looks at how that impacts on ultrafiltration. So here he's looking at ultrafiltration capacity, and you can see in the white squares are shown those patients who are maintained simply on dextrose exchanges, and the black circles are those patients who are maintained on icodextran. And he's looking on the ultrafiltration capacity that happens over time, and you can see in the people maintained on dextrose, there's a decline in ultrafiltration capacity, where those maintained on icodextran, it seems to maintain itself fairly constant. It's sort of a tricky slide to look at. I'm not sure it's presented in the, in the most easy way to interpret, but that's in essence the argument that Simon's making. Um, and this is over a 12 to 24 month period of time. So what is the argument for that? Well, so let's go back and look at what are the changes that occur in the peritoneal membrane with increase in duration of peritoneal dialysis therapy. So the changes are summarized here. First, there's increasing inflammatory markers that occur in the peritoneal cavity. This is now well documented in several studies that you can, if you measure the effluent from PD solution and you measure various inflammatory markers such as IL-6, the levels will increase over time the longer the duration of PD therapy. You get marked thickening of the peritoneal membrane. And this, on the right, the Williams article is a classic study from Williams where he looked at the peritoneal membrane at the start of dialysis, which is shown on the left, and what happens to someone who's been on PD for nine years. You get marked thickening of the submesothelial space in the peritoneal membrane. Incredible changes which occur in the peritoneal membrane over time. You get loss of aquaporin channels in the peritoneal membrane. I'll come back to this in just a second. You get a marked increase in vascularity, and the vascularity increases, again, because of the inflammatory markers which occur. And that's well captured, in, in, in the, I'm sorry, the increase in vascularity in turn results in an increased rate of solute transport. And that's shown on the, the graph on the right-hand side, looking at the alisate plasma creatinine ratios over time. This is a classic study by Simon Davies looking at this, where you can see dialysate plasma creatinine ratios increase over time in patients maintained on PD. Um, and this, in turn, results in an impairment in the ultrafiltration capacity, which I showed on the previous slide. And lastly, you can get hypertrophy of the lymphatics, which also can inf interfere with ultrafiltration capacity, again, presumably related to the inflammatory markers in the peritoneal space. <laughs> 
So again, this is from Simon Davies, and again, I showed you, just showed you the graph in the lower left on the other slide, which is the increasing transport characteristics over time. But what Simon did, and this again is in 2001, he tried to separate out the two groups based on dextrose exposure. So looking at the graph on the upper right, he looked at dextrose glucose exposure, dextrose exposure in kilograms per year, and he broke them down into group one and group two. Group one of the patients where the dextrose exposure remains constant over time, where in group two, the dextrose exposure is really increasing. And then he looked at the change in the transport characteristics, which was shown in the, the purple graph. And you can see the group one guys whose dextrose exposure is constant, there's no change in dialysate plasma creatinine ratio over time. But the blue guys, there's a, a dramatic increase in the dialysate plasma creatinine ratio over time. But what's important, if you look at the dextrose exposure, which is in the top graph, the dextrose exposure is a lot higher prior to the change in the transport characteristics. And Simon then makes the argument that it's the dextrose exposure, the higher dextrose exposure, that's in fact responsible for the increase in the transport characteristics over time. And that goes on to this argument, which is shown here. What's the danger of the dextrose exposure? So this is summarized here, and there's lots of experimental data to support this. Um, I'm happy to give you references on, on any of this if you'd like. But the argument here is that you can get dextrose, the dextrose exposure. When you have heat sterilization, you develop glucose degradation products, the GDPs. The glucose exposure also can bind to proteins in the um, abdominal cavity and form AGEs, which are advanced glycosylation end products. The advanced glycosylation end products bind to the receptors for AGEs. That's the RAGE. That's what the RAGE is there. And this, in turn, stimulates a variety of cytokines being released in the abdominal cavity. Including amongst these are increase in VEGF, which results in angiogenesis, and that's the stimulation for the increased vascularity in the peritoneal membrane. And TGF beta, which has been well shown in experimental studies, the increased matrix production and probably can result in the changes in the peritoneal membrane, which you see occurring over time. So the argument, to take this back now, the argument I'm trying to make here is that the dextrose exposure results in changes in the peritoneal membrane over time, and the strategy that's most important for us then is to limit the dextrose exposure and do that from the beginning. And doing it from the time we start people on PD, our strategy should be to use as little dialysis as we need to to get to the appropriate target to keep the dextrose exposure as low as we can. And the end result of this process is encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. And again, this was covered in an ISPD position paper in 2009 by Edwina Brown from the UK. But you see, the argument that Edwina was making is that you need clinic to make a diagnosis of EPS, you need certain clinical findings, a combination of bowel obstruction combined with features of encapsulation due to peritoneal fibrosis, symptoms such as anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. You need radiological findings, a CAT scan showing peritoneal calcification, bowel thickening, bowel tethering, and bowel dilatation, and pathological changes, um, which you, you see at the time of um, surgery, um, with marked fibrosis at and bowel loops inside the abdominal cavity. So how much of a problem is encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis? Well, this is very nicely captured in this review that was published in the Netherlands Journal of Medicine. I'm not quite sure why I was in this journal and not in a more important journal. But this looked at five registries looking at the incidence of EPS related to the duration of PD therapy. And look what happens after five years. In every registry data, the incidence of EPS goes up dramatically. And people are on PD for 15, say for, um, for nine years, the incidence is about 15 to 20 percent in these studies. It's really quite remarkable, actually. So that goes back to this question then. What do we tell patients who have been on PD for four to five years in terms of developing EPS? So I got a call just um, a few months ago because we we'd actually written a paper where we looked at the incidence of EPS in our unit in patients who had been on PD for five years. Um, so the entry criteria for the study was p someone who had been on PD for five years or more. And we went back and reviewed CAT scans, clinical status, et cetera. It turns out the incidence in our experience was about 15%. Um, and we published this paper in PDI. So I got a call from 
the father of an 18 year old who was um, in Texas and been on PD for six years and his son had developed an incredible case of encapsulating perineal sclerosis. And the question he asked me was, why wasn't this discussed with his family? Why weren't they made aware of the risk of this from developing? Why had no one told them that this could potentially develop if you'd been on, EP, if you'd been on PD for more than five years? And I had no answer to that question. And we thought about this a little bit. And we've now sort of decided that we're going to go back with each of our patients who've been on PD for about four years or so and begin to discuss the risk of EPS, that this can occur after five years. It can get up to about 20% of patients who've been on PD for a long time can develop this. And we ought to really be thinking about this. It's a major problem with the long-term success of PD therapy that has not really gotten nearly enough attention in the literature. And I'm not sure why that is. I think, you, again, one problem is that, I think as Robert suggested yesterday, only 50% of PD patients are still on PD at two years. If you look at the number of people you train or on PD at five years, in most series it's somewhere between 10 and 20%, not much more than that. So the number of people making it out to five years is not that many, but certainly those who do make it out are at risk of developing encapsulating perineal sclerosis, and we need to be thinking about discussing this with patients. And again, we need to be thinking about developing strategies to minimize that risk, and that is from limiting dextrose exposure. So can you predict who develops encapsulating perineal sclerosis? And the, most of the work on this has come from Ray Credit's group um, in Amsterdam. Um, and he's looked at a variety of markers, inflammatory markers in the perineal space, et cetera. And most of those don't really hold up very well. But in this paper that was published just last year in the Advances in Perineal Dialysis, he suggested that the loss of free water transport may be the best predictor of encapsulating perineal sclerosis. So he looked at patients who've been on PD for four to five years, and then he went on and looked at those who developed EPS, and he thought the loss of free water transport was the strongest predictor of those who had developed EPS. So what is free water transport? So this is a schematic diagram of the perineal membrane, sort of shown here. So if you look at the, where I have the perineal cavity there, that's sort of the lining, the perineal space, and fluid can move across the perineal, and solutes can move across the perineal membrane. And then they have to traverse the interstitium to get to the blood capillaries, which is shown in the arrow on the bottom, the green arrow on the bottom. And fluid can also move into lymphatic channels, shown with the red arrow there. But it has to really traverse the interstitium. Importantly, though, when we look at the channels that permit water and solute transport, there are aquaporin channels, which account for 40 to 50 percent of water flow occurs via aquaporin channels. There are small pores in the peritoneal membrane um, which permit solutes to pass through them and water as well. And then there are large pores which permit, permit uh, the passage of large size solutes. Importantly, the majority of water, about half of the water passes through aquaporin channels, the other half through these small pores. Solutes don't pass through aquaporin channels. Solutes only pass through the small pores. So this is what happens if you use a short dwell exchange with a four and a quarter, with a four and a quarter percent dextrose solution. And this is from a paper published um, just a few, few years ago in the American Journal of Physiology. And this is looking at the decline in the sodium concentration in the dialysis solution. And what, what happens here is you put in a hypertonic solution and the sodium concentration, remember the sodium concentration in the dialysis solution is 132. Within 60 to 90 minutes, there's a marked drop in the sodium concentration. And the reason this occurs is because water is moving through the aquaporin channels and diluting the sodium concentration in the dialysis solution. Over time, this will equilibrate with plasma. So the argument that Ray Credit's group is making, it's the loss of the aquaporin channels that is a marker for the development of EPS. And that's the marker for damage to the peritoneal membrane. And in his experience, this is the best way to predict whether patients develop an EPS. So having read this paper and talked to Ray, we've now sort of redecided that we're going to relook at now looking at free water transport in those patients who've been on dialysis for four to five years to see if we can perhaps advise patients that the risk of developing encapsulating perineal sclerosis is greater if they've lost this free water transport. So to do the free water transport test, what you need to do is use 
a hypertonic exchange, a four and a quarter percent solution, and you can let it simply dwell for one hour and drain it out and look for the depression in the sodium concentration as a way of being a predictor, perhaps, of those patients who have lost aquaporin channels. So again, going back, we start something on PD. We need to develop strategies to protect the perineal membrane. We need to limit dextrose exposure, targeting K to V of 1.7 to 2. We need to pay close attention to the volume status. We need to use icodextrin to maintain ultrafiltration to minimize dextrose exposure. We want to use ACE and ARB therapy to preserve residual renal function. Several studies now, including three randomized trials, have shown that ACE and ARB therapy can preserve residual renal function in PD patients to start dialysis. We want to routinely use high-dose loop diuretics to maximize urine output. And the reason you use the diuretics is that if we can keep a good urine output up, you're going to use less dextrose to remove fluid from patients. And lastly is this problem of low GDP solutions. What about these, and what role should these possibly play in, in, a, in our um, preserving the peritoneal membrane? So experimental evidence suggests that there is better preservation of membrane structure and function in low GDP, in low GDP solutions. There's reduced inflammatory response and improved dialysis biomarkers and better preservation of residual renal function. But is there a clinical benefit? Now, if you look around the world, low GDP solutions account for 20% of the PD market worldwide, up to 40% of the PD market in Europe and the Middle East, and 100% of the market in Australia. Now, importantly in Australia, if you talk to the Australians, the cost of the low GDP solutions is the same as it is for regular solutions, and in fact, they're not marketing regular solutions any longer in Australia. Everyone's on low GDP solutions. And the reason for that is the BALANCE study, which is the Australian-New Zealand randomized trial on incident PD patients, 185 patients. With an open label, local PD protocols were used, and patients were on either APD or CAPD. And they looked at the time to anuria, and the time to anuria was significantly less in those patients on low GDP solutions. They looked at time to first perinitis, which was significantly less in patients on low GDP solutions. And when perinitis developed, it was less severe in those patients on low GDP solutions than it was on conventional solutions. And that's shown on the bottom. But the most important is this shown over here. This looks at the change in dialysate plasma ratios with a standard PEC test in low GDP solutions and conventional solutions. And what you can see here, there's an increasing dialysate plasma creatinine ratio over time with the conventional solutions on the right, and the line is much flatter on the left. What confounds this a little bit is the fact that at baseline, there's a higher dialysate plasma ratio in the patients on low GDP solutions for reasons that aren't clear. But if you look at the change over time, which is really what we're most interested in, there really does seem to be a significant difference here. And this was published in NDT in, in 2012. So the Cochrane analysis of low GDP solutions, which was just published um, in March of 2014, says they found that low GDP solutions resulted in better preservation of patients' own kidney function, including urine output, with an average of 126 mils greater urine output per day. And when they looked on, this is a, a, you know, a summary slide of looking at this data from that paper. And you can see there is a significant benefit. The total, if you look at the bottom um, triangle there, there's a significant better preservation of residual renal function. Um, yeah, we can skip this one and go on. Now, so that would seem to be a clear benefit, but there's some very confusing data that's come out that's worth mentioning. So this was a paper also from Australia and New Zealand that came out um, in, in C. Jason in 2013 that doesn't fit with the data that I just showed you. So this was now a cohort-based study looking at patients on low GDP solutions and conventional solutions, and they're looking at the proportion of patients without peritonitis. And surprisingly, the patients on conventional solutions seem to be better than those on low GDP solutions. And if you ask them, how can this be, and you ask the Australians, how, this is against what you just published in the balance study 
They have no explanation for why that is. They say, that's puzzling. They're not sure why, why it came out this way, but that's what it was. So you look at this and you say, do the low GDP solutions really re result in a lowering of peritonitis rates? Well, it's not clear. And then look at this. This is the TRIO trial, which is the Gambrosol versus conventional PD solutions. This is the Gambro low GDP solutions. It's a randomized trial of 101 patients in two centers in Canada and one in Hong Kong. There was a better preservation of residual renal function in those patients in the low GDP solutions. But peritonitis rates were higher in the low GDP solutions, fitting with what I just showed you on the previous slide, but going against what was seen in the balance study. So when I look at this, I'm puzzled about peritonitis, and I think there really may not be an effect on peritonitis rates, but there really is better preservation of residual renal function, and there is less of a tendency to have increasing dialysate plasma ratios over time with low GDP solutions. So if they were, in fact, available in the U.S., which they're not, I would probably use them in almost every patient based on these findings, similar to what the Australians have decided to do. Are they available in Canada or not? The low GDP solutions? They are. And at a price markup or not? Yeah, so in Australia, it's not. It's interesting. It's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know quite how they do that. Anyhow. Again, volume control is one of the most important areas that's, that's gotten a lot of attention in PD really globally now. There's an increasing emphasis on the importance in volume control, and the challenge is to establish and maintain good volume control while minimizing dextrose exposure. So to do that, low salt diets, preservation of residual renal function with ACEs and ARBs, maxing urine, maximizing urine output with high-dose diuretics, are really the cornerstones in the management. And I just want to say a word about icodextran, because again, I'm coming back to this as one of the key things that you need to do in managing patients. Uh, again, the Cochrane analysis from 2014, the patients who received glucose polymer icodextran solutions were 70% less likely to experience uncontrolled episodes of fluid overload. But what I'm more interested in is this idea of minimizing dextrose exposure because you could overcome that by using hypertonic dextrose. But let me show you this paper we published in, in Jason in 2005. This was looking at high and high average transporters. And remember that 65% of patients on PD are high or high average transporters. And looking at long dwell ultrafiltration rates with icodextrin compared to four and a quarter percent dextrose solution. Much higher ultrafiltration with icodextrin. But more importantly is reducing the negative net ultrafiltration with the long dwell exchange. So on the left-hand panel is what happens with high and high average transporters. This is a percentage of patients with negative ultrafiltration. It's about 30 to 40, 35 to 40 percent in both groups. At baseline, the icodextran drops to zero. It stays the same in the patients getting the four and a quarter dextrose solution. And in high transporters, 60% of the patients have net negative ultrafiltration, and that drops to zero with icodextran. Now, why is that so important? Because whatever you don't remove with the long dwell exchange, you must remove with the shorter dwell exchanges. So if a patient's on the cycler, for example, and they're on a long dwell exchange, and they have a negative ultrafiltration of 400 cc's, you need to take off with the cycler whatever they've ingested for the day, plus another 400 cc. So your dextrose concentration really has to rise. So if you buy the argument that dextrose is a bad thing for the peritoneal membrane, the negative ultrafiltration has a, just a horrendous implication for what's gonna happen to the PD membrane over time. So uh, negative ultrafiltration to me is really just terrible and it's something that needs to be avoided. Okay, urgent start PD we talked about, so I won't go over that. <laughs> I want to now shift to some global things and what's happened to PD worldwide. So I want to start just by going through, again, data from the US RDS database from 2014, looking at the incidence and prevalence of end-stage renal disease per million population. And I've highlighted here what's happened in the US and Canada. And this has actually puzzled me for a long time. And I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this. But look at the left, for example. The incidence of end-stage renal disease in the US is about 350 per million population. It's similar to what it is in Taiwan, Japan, for example, and Singapore. Canada, it's less than half of what it is in the US. 
You, know, you can correct this for race. I mean, there's a problem with African Americans with a much higher incidence. But if you just looked at Caucasians, it's going to be about twice the difference. And wh why is this? And wh wh what's going on here? And on the right is the prevalence rates. And again, the U.S. is the highest in the world is Taiwan and Japan. And that's because their mortality rates are much lower than it is, for example, in the U.S. But, you know, the U.S. is over about 60, 70 percent more than it is in Canada, for example, for prevalence rates for end-stage renal disease per unit population. So you can make the argument that people are being started on dialysis in the U.S. who may not need it and may not be dialyzed in Canada, or that people are not being offered dialysis in Canada the way they are in the U.S., or Canada has built in more palliative care sort of um, measures than the U.S. has. I'm not sure, but the, uh, Canada is actually very similar to what you see in most countries in Europe, and the U.S. is similar to what you see in Taiwan and Japan. So it's sort of puzzling to me, and I've never had a really good explanation for what these differences are. Um, perhaps that's something we can talk about during the discussion group. So this now is the percentage of prevalent patients by modality, and again from the USRDS, and the blue is people on hemodialysis, the orange is people on PD, and the sort of the lighter color, the yellowish, is people on home HD. Home HD accounts for a very small percentage, except in New Zealand, um, which is the second one from the bottom. Um, but you see this very wide spread for patients' percentage of people on PD compared to HD. So let's talk a little bit about the, the PD first programs in Hong Kong and Thailand. Um, so in Hong Kong, we'll come up, I'll go show this slide in just a second. We're going to talk about the lack of hemodynamic availability in Mexico and what happens when you have good CKD education programs or well-coordinated CKD education programs. So in Hong Kong, I, talking to Philip Lee, who's now the president of the ISPD, Hong Kong has this PD-first policy. That is that the government will pay for dialysis only if you start on PD. If you have an absolute contraindication, you can go on to hemodialysis. But 80% of patients are maintained on PD. And the argument here is that 85 to, really 85 to 90% of patients actually can actually be trained for PD, and they actually do this in Hong Kong. Importantly, patients in Hong Kong understand that the costs need to be contained to protect the low tax structure and universal health coverage. Taxes in Hong Kong are 15% of income, actually. Um, and people want to preserve that, so they're willing to accept the government dictates on health care policy. And there's universal health care coverage for everybody. Does the patients accept the dictates about health care, such as choices of PD and HC, something that I don't think would fly in the U.S. and probably not in Canada as well. But they're able to do that in Hong Kong. China's got this incredibly rapid growth in perineal dialysis. Interestingly, PD supplies are now being made in China and marketed at a very low cost. And I think Baxter and Fresenius need to think carefully about what's going to happen globally now. We've been talking to China now about getting PD supplies into Africa, for example, because the expense of getting supplies from Baxter and Fresenius is much higher than it would be using Chinese supplies. And we're, we're looking at now getting grants from the Chinese manufacturers' supplies to provide for the, some of the Saving Young Lives projects I talked about yesterday in Africa. So they really are planning a global expansion. But what's interesting about China is the size of the PD units. I think Rob talked about the size of PD units in Canada, but they don't hold a candle to what's going on in China. In Guangzhou, Dr. Yu, who's now the president of the Chinese Nephrology Society, has over 1,000 patients on PD. I mean, if you just think about this, they're training incredible numbers of patients. Um, they're training, you know, probably 10 patients a week. You know, that would be about 500 patients a year. And how they do it is really sort of interesting, and I actually would like to visit and learn more about this. But they, they train 10 patients a week. They have a whole team. They've separated their staff into a team that does training and a team that follows patients after they're trained. They use a lot of videos. They use a lot of classes for training people because they're training so many. Um, and they can train patients generally within a week to go home. Um, this ex their perinitis rates, they claim, are extremely low. Uh, patients are very compliant. How they manage this, I have trouble imagining. The units in Hong Kong are all three to 600 patients. And there are several units in China now that are over 1,000 patients. And the nurse ratios, when you add up the numbers of nurses, runs about 70 to 80 
patience for one nurse? I mean, there's got to be something there that we need to pay attention to. I'm not quite sure what that is. But, you know, they, they claim the results are really very good and the perinitis rates are low. Should we make a visit to China and see what's going on? What do you guys think? <laughs> So Mexico is sort of different. If you look at Mexico, it's sort of interesting what's happened. And again, we talked about a little bit about this yesterday. In Mexico, there's the only good data in Mexico comes from Jalisco State, where Guadalajara is. And um, Dr. Garcia, Guillermo Garcia, has put together a fantastic PD program. But PD utilization had been up at 90% because there were very few hemodialysis units available. But as hemodialysis units were built, the number of people on PD started dropping, and it's now down to about 50%. We talked about this yesterday. You build hemo units, the number of people on PD starts to drop off. Um, and that certainly is what's happened in Mexico. But the lesson from Mexico was that you could train 90% of the people to do PD, just as they did in Hong Kong. So if you don't have the hemo slots available, you can train people to do PD, and they, in fact, will do it at low perinitis rates with good outcomes. It's interesting, the pricing of PD supplies, this is interesting, in Mexico, the government does the contracting, and there's competition from the local Mexican companies. So PD's bags now are sold for about $3 a bag in Mexico. Um, and the important thing here is the government's doing the contracting, so the government puts out a bid for large numbers of PD solutions, and the, the cost really drops. So rather than individual units negotiating on their own, this is the federal government actually negotiating the price of the solutions. So it's the power of the single purchaser, and the prices really drop. The same thing's actually happened in India, with an Indian company making supplies, and the price of bags from Baxter and Fresenius to compete with the Indian company is a little bit over $3 for a two-liter bag. So the cost of PDs is dropped, and when the Chinese come into the market, I think it's going to go down even lower than that. So what happens with my good CKD education? We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but this is data from Holland, from the Nekeset database, and it's old data from 2004. But they looked at all incident patients starting dialysis. 1,300 patients, 38% of the patients started on PD. So Holland has very well organized CKD clinics, um, provide lots of CKD education, they have group classes, etc. Good CKD education, 38% of the patients started on PD. Belgium has a very similar kind of standard set up. Um, this is from um, one of the centers in Belgium. Again, looking 242 patients starting dialysis and 40% of the patients started on home therapy. Um, so again, a large number of people going home. And again, we talked about this yesterday. And I then went around, I was giving a talk in um, Italy about home hemodialysis and I was interested in learning what would happen if you provided, if you took, you just called centers that were very interested in growing home therapies, whether PD and home HD, both of them, and you presented, you educated patients in a relatively fair manner, and you let the patients really make a choice of what was going to happen. Satellite Dialysis in California, if you don't know them, it's a very interesting sort of group where they really focused on home training and home programs. They've built these home centers now, so they have you know, regular hemodialysis centers, but they build home centers which is focused on home hemo and PD training. And they're very, very nicely set up. They look like living rooms, they're not like dialysis units. They're very attractive and they've really made a major effort to grow home therapies. And I called them, this was just about six months ago, what their breakdown was, and it's shown up on that top slide there. We've made a big push to grow home therapies, and this is what we are running here. I called Peter Blake in London, Ontario, and London's been the, one of the great places for home hemodialysis. That's what their numbers for home hemo, there's their numbers in Ontario, that's the numbers there, and Western Australia, which would be similar perhaps to Western Canada where you're covering sort of large areas. But if you look at this graph-wise, the numbers are surprisingly similar. And it's similar to what you'd see in the European centers that do this as well. That in, in models where you offer patients, you make a big effort to grow home therapy, and you've got home hemo units, I mean, center hemo units scattered in your area. This seems to me what the breakdown is. And I, I think, Rob, you sort of talked about this yesterday. That's what the breakdown is um, in Alberta as well. So to me, this is an interesting lesson, again, looking around the world, what centers have done, the way the breakouts can occur.
when patients are really off the therapies. And this perhaps is a target that we should be shooting for. We've made a big push to get our home numbers up. We just can't do it. And I don't, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do much better than this. Now, if there were not home slots or the insurance pictures changed, you could get a lot more people at home, but that's not what's going to happen, I think, if you offer education and let patients actually make choices. <laughs> so what's happened to the incidence of end-stage renal disease? Um, and this is sort of interesting now, and I'm, I'm not sure what the data is in Canada. This is from the US RDS in 2014. Look at that top graph. The incidence is actually dropping per million population. Now, if your population grows, the incidence will go up, but this is per million population. There's really been a drop in the incidence of end-stage renal disease occurring. Um, and on the lower left is shown by age, and on the lower right is shown by diagnosis for diabetes and hypertension. It's dropping across the board, basically. Now, why this is, is it can be, there are two explanations why this could be. One is that patients are not being started on dialysis at higher GFRs. When you look at the USRDS database, and again, the, the USRDS database is two years old, that this is data from 2012, not 2014. 40% of the people in the U.S. start with EGFRs over 10, which I find difficult because it seems to me almost no one should be starting an EGFR over 10, and we generally don't start to eat EGFRs of 5 to 10. So one explanation here could be that people have learned now that you don't start people at EGFRs over 10, and they're delaying the start of dialysis. The other explanation is we've gotten better at managing patients with CKD, and the instance is truly dropping. I'm not sure what the true explanation for this is. That remains to be determined. But there's been a large uptick, though, in the use of perineal dialysis. So um, on the upper right is shown the incidence of end-stage renal disease, and the lower right, the lower right, the prevalence. And the PD numbers are shown in that orange bar, which is at the bottom. And it doesn't show so well here, but it shows very clearly over here um, now when I expand the graph. So again, the PD is the orange on the upper right on the incidence as the orange line, there's been a huge uptick in the use of PD in the United States, and the prevalence rates have increasing as well. There's been an increase in home hemo as well, which is shown in the lighter yellow thing on the, on the bottom of the incidence and the prevalence numbers as well. So um, home dialysis is growing, but remember that home PD in the U.S. Runs a, has been running traditionally about 7 to 8 percent. Now it's up to about 10 to 11 percent. And I think those numbers are going to increase, and eventually, to me, the numbers should get up eventually to 20 to 25 percent, as I showed you from centers that really make an effort to grow dialysis. The reason it's growing in the U.S. is because U.S. has gone to this bundled payment system, and PD is incredibly more profitable in the U.S. So you get paid the same thing in the U.S. for putting someone on PD as you do for putting someone on hemodialysis. The costs of PD are less, particularly in a bundled setting, where ESA utilization is much less, you don't use IV iron, things like that. So the cost is a huge cost savings on PD. And that has really given rise to this marked growth in PD in the United States. And lastly, I want to just reemphasize the lessons from the developing world that I talked about yesterday. That the use of PD to treat patients with AKI is, is really well established in the developing world. And the lessons we learned from that, nephrologists can be taught to place catheters very easily. It's very easy training nephrologists to place catheters. And you can use these cuff flexible catheters immediately after placement with low complication rates. That's the studies from Brazil, the studies I showed you yesterday from Sudan, and the experience with the Saving Young Lives Project. People have actually done very well. So in conclusion, the outcomes of PD have improved dramatically over the last several years. PD utilization is increasing worldwide for both end-stage renal disease and AKI. Practice patterns vary widely globally, driven by government policy, educational, educational support for CKD clinics, financial considerations, etc. A global census has been developed for the basic standards of care in PD patients, and this has resulted in improvement in outcomes for PD patients globally. And we can learn lessons looking around the world and seeing what other countries are doing. And I think it's something we need to keep in mind as we sort of move forward. So thank you.